Columbia Workshop under the direction of William N. Robeson. Columbia Workshop presented an English play in American radio technique. Tonight, the workshop offers an English play in the British radio technique. A presentation of our guest director, a young man known in the farthest corner of the British Empire for the brilliance of his radio plays, the excellence of his radio production. Mr. Val Gielgud, dramatic director of the British Broadcasting Corporation. The play you are about to hear is Mr. Gielgud's first American broadcast, although workshop listeners will remember his production of Death of a Queen, which was relayed from London by shortwave last September and which introduced an entirely new technique to American listeners. Tonight, Mr. Gielgud will direct a radio play entitled Fours into Seven Won't Go, written by himself and Commander Stephen King Hall. At the end of the play, the workshop has asked Mr. Gielgud to give the American audience a brief conception of the contrasts and differences between American and British broadcasting. The Columbia Workshop presents Fours into Seven Won't Go. Hartfield. He always was an obstinate devil. Fancy taking women and children into the interior in these days. If you want my opinion, Tommy, he asked for it. Perhaps. <clears throat> he was a damn good fellow all the same. I expect he thought he was well enough known and sufficiently popular to get away with it. After all, he must know the Chinese more intimately than any Englishman in the country. He was efficient enough, certainly. I saw a good deal of him at one time. Long, lean beggar, hard as nails. Good fellow to work with, but... I don't think I should like to be married to him. <laughs> don't tell me he ever asked you, George. No, but seriously. I wonder how Isabel Hartfield likes it. There was always a regular woman's man side about Henry. <laughs> no, I don't mean anything fishy. You never <laughs> saw him without some woman or another. I was always surprised that he didn't run into a scandal. Yeah. What's Lady Hartfield like? Isabel? She was one of the prettiest girls I ever knew. She must be 35 now, but she always knew her own mind. I liked her. And what about this Anstruther woman, as you seem to be the child's guide to knowledge? Well, I only met her once or twice. She's an American. Oh. She came out to live at the Hartfield mm. and brought her kid after her husband died. I think she had known Isabel well in England. She must be two or three years younger. She's good looking, but in just the opposite way. Isabel's tall and dark, and Mrs. Anstruther's small and blonde. And uh, which does our particular gentleman prefer? Oh, I'm not hinting at any scandal. Don't you make any mistake about that. Henry and Isabel are absolutely devoted. They're one of the very few couples I know who've managed to make a success of marriage. 
Mrs. Ann's father is far more Isabel's friend than Henry's. Hmm. It's those kids I can't help thinking about. Uh, this country is going to the dogs, you know. Uh, what we want is a bit more mailed fist and a little less soft soap. Oh, come off it, you old diehard. Have a drink. <laughs> no, I don't mind that. But all of those four miserable children are under ten. And that bandit fellow is a brute. Gilbert swears he was behind the massacre of the missionaries at Tanfu. You know what the Chinese bandits are if they're in a hole? That ransom can't be paid. It's absurd. And if they think the Japanese are going to catch them up, well, I don't like to think of it. Well, don't think of it, then. Hartfield may be able to get around them. He can talk the language, which is something. And even a bandit knows that an ex-consul general has no end of a pull and might make things pretty unpleasant. Mm, all I can say is I wouldn't care to be in any of their shoes. I wonder what they're feeling at this minute. I bet they haven't got cushioned chairs and ice drinks. I wonder what they're talking about. Well, Beatrice, there you are. What's the time? My watch has stopped. Yes, yeah, so's mine. I forgot to wind it last night. Oh, so you were upset in spite of seeming so calm. Yeah. Weren't the children marvelous, though? They weren't scared a bit. Ignorance is bliss, my dear. You mean you really are scared? Unspeakably. But Why? They haven't hurt us or starved us. But this hut makes quite decent quarters. And old Wu's American accent makes me feel quite homey. Oh, don't pretend to behave as if you were in a cheap novelette, Beatrice. Harry's been out there in the sun for two solid hours. It seems like two centuries. Hey, Harry, Isabel. Oh, I'm all right. I'm thinking of him. Oh, can't you believe that I'm still in love with my husband after 13 years? Why, sure. Gosh, I wish I'd put on thicker stockings yesterday. Gee, these cost me a fortune, and just look at them. <laughs> oh. I'm afraid we've worse things than stockings to worry about, Beatrice. Oh, Harry, thank God you're back. I was beginning to... Harry, my dear, give me some water, will you? Thank you. Henry, you look ghastly. Is it the sun? I wish it was. No, the authorities have refused to pay the ransom. I expected this course. Expected but... it? But it's damnable. Quite apart from us and the children. After all your years in the service, surely they... Be fair, Isabel. Once pay the brutes, and there's no end to it. It's simply encouraging kidnappers all over China. I guess that's true. Well, I guess we'll have to put up with a week or two of hiking that we didn't anticipate. If Wu will get me some sandals, I don't mind so much. Well, Henry, what is it? It's pretty bad. I don't like to tell you, but... What is it, Harry? Well, the Japanese troops are on our trail. Swell! Didn't I always boost their efficiency, Isabel? Wu and his men are short of rations and ponies. But this is all good for our chances, but Henry. But some of our chances, Beatrice. Some? Wu strikes camp and moves north in one hour. He can only take three of us with him. Well? The other four will... will die before he starts. The other four? Wu means what oh, he no. says, my dear. No! No! Well, come on, tell us. Which of us don't go? That's the worst of it. He declines to decide. He leaves the choice to us. You see, Wu doesn't care. It's just a matter of arithmetic as far as he is concerned. But how can we? The children had it. There are four of them. It means... Oh, how can we? We must face it, my dear. As if we were on a sinking ship and there were only room for three in the only boat. These things happen. We must do what we can. Yeah. And... Hey, have my handkerchief, Isabel. It's cleaner. Now, listen. We've got to be sensible and dispassionate. And frank. Frank above everything. If we lose our heads, we may make a really bad mistake. I'm sorry, Harry. I'll do my best. I know you will, dear. We must all keep our end up in front of Wu. In front of Wu? Yes, he proposes to be present while we make up our minds. As a matter of fact, it mayn't be such a bad thing. It'll help to keep us reasonably dispassionate. Dispassionate? We've got to achieve that. Unless we want to be hysterical or go raving mad. As I pointed out just now, Wu means what he says. But there's this much consolation. The children will know nothing about it. You mean they'll die in their sleep? Painlessly. Yes. I've his word for that. Queer devils, these people. 
I believe he's honestly sorry to have to force us to the decision at all. Sorry? Why, that cruel, inhuman brute. Do you realize, Beatrice, that one of the children at least will have to... Steady, Isabel. Oh, well, Steady. I am hard. My dear, please, he's here now. All right, Harry. I'll do my best not to. Not to disgrace your old school time. You'll have to buy a new one when you get back to Shanghai, dear. The old Estonian society would never recognize that one. Isabel. I do not intrude, I hope. Oh, no. We were expecting you. The master has said, make no movement which is contrary to just principle. Is it principle, as you call it, to murder children in their sleep? Isabel, please, it is nothing. Superior men are not always virtuous. Men of principle are sure to be bold. But those who are bold may not always be men of principle. I will not interrupt your deliberation, but in the words of the master, I would advise you to put aside the point of which you stand in doubt and to speak cautiously at the same time of the other. In doubt? Oh. Won't you sit down, General? Thank you. Well? You know, I'm finding it extraordinarily difficult to begin. When a man is in difficulties, can he be other than slow in speaking? To speak is easy. To act is difficult. Oh, you'll probably despise me for it. I know you will, Beatrice, but I can't help it. Is it useless to appeal to your mercy? Entirely. I must think first of myself and my companions at the mercy of the Japanese. You are if I may say so, without impropriety, no more than barbarians. The relation between superiors and inferiors is like that between the wind and the grass. You are the grass. The grass must bend when the wind blows across it. Hey, don't you think we'd better get down to brass tacks, Henry? I suppose so. Well, you don't sound particularly interested. How can I be? The results are all too horrible to contemplate. In any case, I come first on the list to die. Oh, that nonsense. You're the most valuable of us all. The best brain, the best person. You've your real life to live after years of official routine. You're too intelligent, Henry, to begin to talk of women and children first. See, in this sort of situation, that's just bunk. Besides, think of the children. Well, I'm assuming you'll take care of Jane for me. A father can do more for them than a mother, in my opinion. That's arguable. But what isn't arguable is this. I can do nothing for anyone if I survive. Harry, why? Why? Use your imagination for a moment, my dear. Sir Henry Hatfield of the China service leaves his wife, another woman and several children to meet a cruel death to preserve his own life. I should be a pariah from London to Hong Kong. I should have to change my name and disappear. I and mine would be outcast. No, thank you. You can count me out. I hate the idea of dying, but I prefer to die quickly than endure a death in life. But, Henry... And that's not exaggeration, Beatrice. It's fact. It's horrible. Yeah. But I'm afraid it's true. Of course it's true. You pay for privilege in the long run. A fact which those who haven't been born to it most conveniently forget. A gentleman can live as badly as he please. He must die well. Or be damned in this world and the next. He who offends against heaven has none to whom to pray. But have we all offended? Harry, the children. Of the children, three are female. In your country, as in mine, there exist too many women. In China, many female children are considered of very small account. You're the devil. Fine words are seldom associated with true virtue. I have only said what is demonstrably true. Well, let's leave the children out of it for the moment. See, I always left the toughest question to last in my exam papers at school. Well, so do you, Isabel. Yes. How did you know? I snitched from you a good bit. Did you? I always wondered. Yeah, well, now you know. Henry, you almost convinced me just now... But why should the circumstances ever become public property? Isabel would back up any story you chose to invent. And I, 
Well, supposing I was cynical enough to accept that, what about you? I should be dead. You? Why not? My husband's dead. The only other man I ever cared for is, well, someone else's. Beatrice. Yes, my dear, you. Well, we're being frank. We must be with one foot already in the grave. I've loved you ever since I came to live with you and Isabel. I've loved you no less because I'm as fond of her as one woman can be of another. But you're not mine. You never could be. My life, or my real life, is finished. Well, I loathe the idea of dying. I'm scared. But I've nothing to live for except Jane. And if I know anything of mothers with only daughters, I shall probably do her more harm than good. Yes, you can't defeat my claim. That it can't. But I can. You, Isabel. But how? Because I've known that you loved Harry. Because you're the sort of woman he should have married. One silly and cowardly and unhelpful. I've never helped him. I've always been a drag. No, my dear. Oh, yes, I have. I know. You've been very sweet to me, Harry. You've been in love with me. But does love matter very much to us anymore? I think so. Isabel, you're simply finding excuses for an orgy of unreasoning self-sacrifice. I'm not... I'm only remembering that one of my children will have to die. Do you think I'd let any one of them go into the dark alone? Oh, I'm frightened. More than either of you. But I'd rather die a thousand times than go on living with that memory in my heart. I can't argue with that any more than I can accept Beatrice's solution of my problem. Isabel, would you find it harder if we died together? I've always hoped that we might die together, Harry. I don't want to live without you. And Beatrice could take the children. Which of them? Is that so easy for you? Well, I won't live at the price of Jane's life. If I live, she lives too. Well, only three of us can live in all. Which of your three do you leave to me? Which do you condemn with yourself to join in this gloriously high principle suicide pact? Teddy's ten, Angela five, Carolyn four. And Teddy's a boy. The general would choose him. But are you going to adopt his notions of what to do with superfluous girl babies? Beatrice, don't be so bitter. It's hard enough, God knows. Don't make it harder for me. Aren't you making it harder for me? Aren't you driving me into a corner? Am I to watch two of the people I love best in the world go off to their deaths and laugh at it? And I fight for my friend's life. Do you to a drunk with self-sacrifice? You shan't decide under that influence. It's crazy. For a man to sacrifice to a spirit that does not belong to him is flattery. For once I agree with you, General. I am honored. The thing that strikes me as most remarkable in this business is the persistence of selfishness in our human makeup. Here we are, with death at our elbows, and we still go on fighting desperately for our own hands. You're angry with our attempts at self-sacrifice, Beatrice. But you're angry for the wrong reason. You're angry because we're emotional. Really, Isabel and I are being as selfish in making death our preference as you are. Honestly, I know I'd rather die than try to live down the reputation of being a coward and a cad. And honestly, Isabel would rather die than see Teddy or Angela or Caroline go, just as you would over Jane. We can't forget ourselves, and our children are only part of ourselves. You analyze with exactitude. The master has said, while heaven does not let the cause of truth perish, what can the people do to me? Yes, and a greater than he once denied his mother and his brethren. If we were divine, we could choose. But we're human and weak and ordinary. We can't see beyond one fact. The seven of us, so nearly and dearly bound together by every sort of human tie, and four of us bound to die within the hour. I regret that it is so. Give us a little more time, won't you? We're still half dazed with the shock. I can't think cool even if I dared to. Harry, the authorities would pay if you insisted. General, let my husband give you his word to come back if he fails. Then let him go. He could get the pursuit checked while he arranged for the ransom to be paid for. I will gladly take his word, but it is your first. You sir? Yes, your husband will not go. Harry. He's right. Why? Oh, don't be stupid, Isabel. You ought to know Henry well enough by now. He's old-fashioned, that's all. He won't buy his life at the expense of his reputation. 
He won't buy ours at the expense of the government he serves. Doesn't he deserve that they should pay? He's given the service the best years of his life. I'd be condemning other people to the same fate. Once let it be known that a bandit, uh, forgive me, General, has been bought off on my account, and kidnapping will become the staple industry of any band of Chinese who can raise a dozen rifles and some good ponies. It's out of the question. Even if I ask you for the sake of the children. That's not fair, Isabel. Fair. Harry. Even then, I'm afraid. So it's deadlock. Kill us all, General, and have done with it. Murder us all. What is unnecessary, I find most distasteful. I think on this point I can speak for all of us. My wife is naturally upset. But feelings are apt to be closer to reality than reason in circumstances of this kind. I can't survive if any of the others are to die. Neither Mrs. Anstruther nor my wife will face life at the expense of their children. It's obviously impossible for us to condemn Mrs. Anstruther's child against her will. And as there are four children, even if all three of us die, one of my children would have to die also. We can't make such a choice. I refuse, point blank. So we will all die together and trust in God. You're right, Henry. Yes. There's no other way. I am to accept this as your final decision? Yes. Will you listen to me for a few moments? We're in your hands. But I think we should all be grateful if you would leave us to ourselves for the little time we have left. It will not take long. Last year, I received an invitation to Geneva. It was the 66th, or it may have been the 67th, meeting of the International Conference on Disarmament. It appeared that my reputation as a bandit, there was no need, Sir Henry, to apologize for the use of the word, had become so widespread that I was invited as representative of the bandit population of China. While in that singular but salubre city of Switzerland, I happened to become acquainted with a delegate from one of the smaller republics of South America. This gentleman expressed great indignation one morning because he had overheard a reference to himself as a San Diego by one of the Anglo-Saxon representatives. In the veins of this South American ran the blood of the Incas. In his heart was the inextinguishable tradition of an ancient civilization. He spoke of the Anglo-Saxon as barbarian. As you know, we in China are apt to make use of the same term. I was interested as a former student of Anglo-Saxon history in the universities of Canton and California. Accordingly, I pointed out to my South American companion that while the Anglo-Saxons are in many ways barbarous and without culture, yet they possess their own virtues and notably physical courage. This he denied. The conversation ended inconclusively. But on my return to China, it seemed to me that to test the matter would not be without interest. Test? You mean that... I determined to secure the persons of several barbarians and face them with the imminence of sudden death. If they showed cowardice, I would kill them. If they fulfilled my contention that only in physical courage is their civilization superior to ours, I would set them free. Free? Oh, oh Harry. You shall be escorted to the Japanese pickets under a flag of truce within the hour. I am infinitely grateful to you for your cooperation in my little investigation into the habits of the barbarians. For any inconvenience caused to you, I apologize. You will go down to the Yangtze River. I shall withdraw to the northern hills. As the master has said, 
The wise find delight in water. The virtuous find delight in hills. I have the honor to wish you the happiness of a safe journey. You have just heard Fours into Seven Won't Go, a British radio play written by Mr. Val Gielgud and Commander Stephen King Hall and presented by the Columbia Workshop under the guest direction of Mr. Gielgud. The Columbia Workshop is honored to present to the American audience for the first time Mr. Val Gielgud, dramatic director of the British Broadcasting Corporation. Ladies and gentlemen, you've just heard an example of the type of plays we broadcast in England. I'm afraid that in some ways... It is not a very typical example, and probably some of you are thinking that we might between us have chosen a rather better author to begin with. But in choosing a play, I was rather handicapped by one thing, this business of timing, which is such a very different matter here than it is in England. In England, I can fit time to my plays. Here, you must fit plays to your time. You see, it's nothing out of the way in England for a broadcast play to last for as much as an hour and a half. I expect that some of you may have heard of what we call in England the production method of multiple studios and the dramatic control panel. That's a bit of a mouthful. What it means is simply that we take the various ingredients that make up a play, actors, music, sound effects, and so forth, separate them in different studios, and mix the output of those studios at a central mixing and control point known as the dramatic control panel. Now, a lot of rubbish has been talked about this method in rather highbrow terms. Some people, and even some authors, have made the mistake of thinking that a play done in eight studios is eight times as effective as a play done in one. That's pure nonsense. The multiple studio method is simply one more bit of machinery. If your play is very simple, like our play tonight, it is acted in one or two studios only. It's if the complications of production require it that there's any merit in adding to the number of your studios. Now, Mr. Robeson may not thank me for putting what I'm going to say into your head. But the Columbia Workshop is an organization which seems to me to take the business and the art of radio seriously. I confess to having picked its brains for more than one of its ideas to reproduce in England. And I believe that the people who back the whole notion of the workshop will agree with me upon the importance to them of knowing what you feel about their work, of hearing your suggestions and your criticisms, and even your praise once in a while. You can't throw bricks at us in the studio, and we can't hear you applaud. It's terribly important that you shouldn't let us feel for a minute that we are just pushing out stuff into a void. If you do, it may easily become just stuff. And if that is bad for you, it's worse for us. I should just like to add my personal thanks to Mr. Robeson for giving me the opportunity of working for you, to the actors who have worked for me, and to you for having listened both to the play and to me. Good night. Thank you, Mr. Gielgud. The Columbia Workshop appreciates your kindness in interrupting your American holiday and making of it in part. (laughs) Heard on tonight's presentation of Fours into Seven Won't Go were Naomi Campbell as Beatrice, Wanda Paul as Isabel, Reginald Bates as Henry, Dennis Green and George Graham as the two men in the club, Dwight Weist as the Chinese general, and George Tiplady as the radio announcer. The workshop is keenly interested to receive the reactions of the American audience to this British play and to the comments upon British and American radio just made by Mr. Gielgud. Will you kindly address your criticisms, comments, or suggestions to the Columbia Workshop, care of the Columbia Network, New York City. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System.